Bonjour, je suis le membre de Fair Historian. Aujourd'hui, nous allons parler du chat qui a permis à la France de gagner la première guerre mondiale. And to all those who don't like to eat pan au chocolat in the morning, good afternoon. I'm the member of Historian, and today we'll talk about the tank that won the First World War for France. And I know that some of you may already be screaming with things like the US won the war, or the British had the most important tanks, and stuff like that. I don't care. These armor vehicles change armor combat and, therefore, can be defined as a revolutionary weapon. This is the Renault FT. The First World War, that started in 1914, was a breaking point in warfare history. Few could have predicted the immense amount of blood and sufferings that it caused in years of stalemate. This was mostly because of technology, like the machine guns or the high explosive shell, that in the years prior to the Great War were transformed from unreliable and rare elements to the most important factor of warfare, against what a simple flesh and bone human was no match, unless used with interesting tactics or even better technology. Being World War I a conflict that was fought in the Western Front, from the British Channel to the Swiss Alps, this gave no possibilities for maneuver warfare, as all movement ahead would mean frontal attacks against entrenched enemies. Something was needed to punch the line, something heavy and invincible against enemy machine guns and rifle fire. Something like a land battleship. The British would be the first to achieve such thing. However, other nations were already working on a land battleship as well, even before the war. For France, one of the most important persons was artillery colonel Jean-Baptiste Eugène Estienne, that conceptualized a 75mm cannon on a vehicle capable of moving on all types of terrain. The colonel approached a famous car company, Renault, on the 21st of December 1915 to propose an armored vehicle based on the Holt Caterpillar tractor. However, Mr. Renault refused, stating that they had no experience in truck vehicles and that they were already busy producing war materials. Therefore, Mr. Estienne went to the Schneider company that accepted and started producing the Schneider CA, a 13.6-ton box armed with a short barrel 75mm cannon and two Hotchkiss machine guns, and operated by a crew of six. The Schneider was not the best design in the war, and it had major flaws. Colonel Estienne tried the game with Renault on the 16th of July 1916, and this time the manufacturer accepted the proposal. It shall be noted that probably Mr. Renault had started developing the idea after the first meeting, considering the speed at which the wooden mock-up was ready. Renault had to compete with other two designs, the aforementioned Schneider CA and the Saint Charmant, that was basically a Schneider CA on steroids, with a bigger guns and mostly bigger problems. Both tanks were very heavy and complex, and these are important mainly for two reasons. Heavy means that some components, like the engine, the transmission, the trucks or the suspension, are under heavy stress, usually all four combined. This means that the element that are supposed to bring, usually, forward the tank are prone to breakdowns, and a tank that is immobilized is, most of the times, useless. The complexity also makes the problem of breakdown even worse. To top it all up, we are talking about a nation, France, that is in a material crisis, and the resources needed for the tanks, like the steel or the electrical parts, could be used somewhere else. This means that big and complex designs are not the best solution, probably, for a nation like this, and to go down the big and heavy path might not be the best option for a nation as it might prove as a waste of resources. Yes, World War II Germany, I'm looking at you. We are now, however, decided on a different path. Not something big in low numbers, but a lot of small tanks that could be used like mosquitoes to swarm the enemy. And ironically, the objective is to have more tanks than the enemy has anti-tank equipment. Basically, some of you may die, but this is a sacrifice that I'm willing to make. Renault set up the basic specification, and Renault's most experienced designer, Rudolf Ernst Mazmeyer, was employed on the project. In the end, the vehicle that came out was a 5 meters long, 6.5 ton armor fighting vehicle that had a crew of two, and this was important, a rotating turret. In fact, this was the first tank in the world to be mass produced with a 360 degrees movable turret. The idea of the turret was not new. It had already been used with success on armored cars and some other tanks had been designed with turrets, but this was the first tank to be mass produced and used in combat that featured one. The turret gave the advantage of being able to fire in every direction without the need of having a lot of guns. The vehicle was small and light, and this was done on purpose because the engines of the time were not very happy when used in very heavy vehicles. 
The tank was armored with hardened steel plates that had a thickness between 8 and 22 mm, enough to stop rifle and machine gun bullets. The armor was also able to resist against K bullets into were armor piercing rounds for the Mauser rifle, and sometimes resist also against the projectiles from the Tankgewehr model 1918, that was a German anti tank rifle. The FT came in two combat versions one armed with a Hotchkiss model 1914 8mm machine gun and one armed with a 37mm short barrel Pute SA-18. At first the turret was casted circular design similar to the one of the mock-up and had the machine gun. When Colonel STN proposed the cannon it was found that it was hard to combine it with the turret. The French company Berlier proposed a polygonal turret made of riveted steel plates that could carry the machine gun but also was able to be used with the cannon. Because of the design and of the fact that it was riveted, it was easier to produce, thus making it suitable for mass production. In 1918, Giraud created another turret model, again casted in circular, but this time it could use also the cannon and at the end of the war this turret became more common than the polygonal one from Berlier. As said before, the FT had a crew of two, one driver and one commander gunner. The driver sat in the front of the vehicle while the commander gunner was in the turret. The commander was heavily overloaded because he had the job to spot the enemy position, load the gun, aim it, fire it, observe the effect of the shells and stuff like that. On the bright side, one man turrets were very easy to produce and very light. He also had to inform his driver on where to go and since there was no way to communicate inside the tanks such as internal radios, he simply kicked the driver in different parts of his body and I guess that the driver was not very happy about this. Another important feature of the FT was that the tank was divided in compartments, one for the crew and one for the engine. This might not seem a lot, but I guess the crews appreciated that they were not being poisoned by carbon monoxide, as it happened in all the other World War I tanks, as the FT was the only one that featured compartments, while the others had a single big room that housed the crew, the guns and the engine. Also, internal ventilation pushed the air from the crew compartment to the back and outside the vehicle, and I guess this also helped removing the fumes from the gun. The tank featured a Renault engine with four cylinders that gave the vehicle the speed of around 7 km per hour. I have conflicting sources on the engine power, some saying 30 horsepower and some 35, and some even 39. This might not seem a lot, but remember that it did not have the need for high speeds as its job was to support the infantry on the assault. The mobility of the tank was not bad, as its wide front wheel gave it better cost counterabilities than straight track designs, and thanks to the fact that the truck was kept under pressure by spring, it helped in reducing the chance of derailing. To help avoiding rollover while crossing trenches, a tail was added. The French ordered 3,530 vehicles in 1917, and because this was too much for no alone, some were produced by other companies. Renault produced 1,850 tanks, Berlioz 800, Saumois 600, and Villeneuve Belleville 280, and they probably mispronounced half of those. In 1918, the order was increased to 7,820. The production rates were again redistributed similarly, but the war ended before that many could be produced. In the end, 3,694 tanks were produced by France before the end of the war. And I'm not sure if this number includes the first batch of 150 tanks that were produced for training purposes. The MG version accounted for three-fifths of the total production, around 2,200 tanks, while the Canon version accounted for one-third of the production, around 1,200 vehicles. There was also a command version called Shell Signal or Telegraph Sans Field, Telegraph Without Cables, that had a three-man crew and was not armed, and around 100 of these were produced. I guess that this tank communicated with the HQ and not with the other tanks as the combat version had no radios. Another version with a 75mm short gun was produced, the FT-75BS but known so combat service. Some self-propelled gun versions were designed, tested and produced in low numbers but these two did not so service. The United States planned to produce 4,440 M1917 tanks that were modified FTs but only 64 were produced before the end of the war and none of these saw combat. Therefore, to keep US forces, France supplied 144 FTs to the American, who used them in their light tank brigade, but more on this in the next episode. 24 FTs were given to the British and 3 or 4 tanks to the Italian. 
The British used them for liaison purposes, while the Italians used those as test bed for the development of their tank industry. In fact, the Italian plan was at first to simply copy the design, but then they decided to improve it, and we will look at the result in the next episode. Also, Romania received a small batch before the end of the First World War, used for training for a possible Romanian tank unit, but none so combat service. In the next part, we will take a look at, at foreign development of the tank, combat usage and the legacy of this revolutionary weapon. This brings an end to our video. I hope you liked the return of our first series. As always, if you enjoy this type of content, feel free to subscribe and share this video to your baguette eating friends. Thank you for watching and remember that heavy tanks are usually not the best solution for nations that are facing production problems.